afternoon. Let us pray. Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. And let us pray the collect of the day. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now please be seated or just make yourself comfortable as we read the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing that it was what was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? And he answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those who gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his ear. This slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? Are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know not what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to that wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas came sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose Peter, Peter cut 
His ear, Peter, had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they, said, then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. But Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not hand him over to you. Pilate said to him, Take him yourselves, and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. Pilate asked him, So are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it would have been given you from above. Therefore, no one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. 
Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. And so they took Jesus. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to the Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots, for it is for to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill this scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of wine on the branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. But they, so they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified man broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first of the other men, other who had crucified with who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced the, his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look at the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked people, Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
In the name of the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered who you might have been in the story that I just read in Jesus' last day? Would you have shouted Hosanna earlier in the week only to shout crucify him a few days later? Would you have denied him even though you were named Peter, the rock on which the church would be built? Would you have mocked him as he stumbled by on the road to his crucifixion? Or would you have been weeping beside him as he took his last breath? I don't know about you, but I would like to think that I would have stood by him, that I would have been with him in his final moments. But don't we all want to think of ourselves as taking on that role instead of a role that reveals our own fears, our frailties, and our own self-doubts? Each year on this day, I wonder and I pray that I would have been the one of those who showed up and stayed remaining faithful and strong, even if I feared the authorities would be after me. But if I'm honest with myself, I could easily, easily have been one of those who walked away silently, hoping not to be noticed, slinking back into the shadows of society. This is a Good Friday like no other, and maybe it is a perfect Good Friday as we all stand in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of our own isolation, sectioned off from the world, in our own little worlds, away from the family and friends that we love. Maybe some of us are feeling that same isolation, that same sense of abandonment, that perhaps Jesus Felt. You know, showing up is important. Being <clears throat> present with others in times of crisis can be a calming balm for those who are grieving. But it is difficult just to show up. Because although it doesn't require anything of us, it, we often want to crowd our presence with words of advice, with chatter, with idle talk with activity, when all that is needed is us, our true self, our heart, our love, and our prayers. Nothing less, but nothing more. Being present in this manner is difficult. It may reveal our own fears, our own doubts, our own insecurities, but that is what it means to be present with one another. Recently, I heard someone say, and I quote, life is not defined by what we let go, but by what we let in. What we let in, what we walk towards, what we open ourselves up to. It must have been difficult for those few who stayed with Jesus until his last breath and beyond to walk towards the cross and not hide from it. To watch the gruesome death of a son, a loved one, would have been too much to bear for most. But they did show up, and they did remain. And they prayed silently, and they wept. They let their heart be broken open so that the one who was truly suffering knew he was not alone in his final hours. As we live in this new time, a time that is still unfolding, a time that is so uncertain that we know, we don't know when it will end, those who have God's light to share need to show up, need to show up in ways they may have never imagined. Now with our own limitations to do what we have always done, we must create new ways to be present, to let in new life 
not to let it go, to walk towards it, not away from it. May we learn from this worldwide pandemic that Jesus' sacrificial love is what will fuel our hearts to, to, towards change for a better world. Not fear, not isolation, not finger pointing that surrounds us. May we be open to hearing God's voice beckoning us towards sharing our light by showing up and being still and giving room for God's grace to be present and felt by us and others. May we not be afraid to play, pray silently or aloud for and with others, including the stranger and even our feared enemy. God's light of light is being revealed each and every day, even in this dark day, because we are promised that death does not have the last word, nor does COVID-19. No, tomorrow will come and we will celebrate in Jesus' resurrection. And sometime soon, I promise you, we as a community of faith will gather together in our sacred space, raise up our voices in thanksgiving and praise, and to sing and pray and be with one another knowing that we have become better messengers of God's dream for a better world than we were before our mandated isolation. But to rejoice on Easter morning, we still must be willing to show up, be present in this current sorrow of Jesus on the cross and our current health crisis. We want to close it off, not let fear and darkness shroud our world. No, no, darkness does not get the last word. Love must be the last word. And it will if we show up. Amen. Let us pray. We pray for people everywhere according to their needs. For the church throughout the world, its unity and witness and service, for bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for all members of our virtual congregation, for all nations and peoples of the earth, for our president and Congress, the United Nations, and all who serve the common good for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, especially those inflicted by COVID-19, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and oppressed, the sick, the wounded and crippled, those in loneliness and fear and anguish, those who face temptation, doubt and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger and all who care for them. For those who have not received the gospel of Christ, who have never heard the word of salvation or lost their faith or are hardened by sin or indifference, the contemptuous and scornful, the enemies of the cross of Christ, the persecutors of his followers and those who, in the name of Christ, have persecuted others. Amen. And now let us take a few moments of silence.
Let us say together, we adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because of your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to sinners, everlasting life and glory. For the Father and the Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now will remain here in silence for a few moments longer, as long as you need. <laughs> 